Majora's Mask, Chapter 42, Song of Fire. The barn was empty. Its shattered roof allowed starlight to wash over the abandoned wooden floor and pile of debris. Epona paced around the building, as if expecting Link to come out and greet her. Tattle remained rooted to the spot where she'd seen it happen. The orange orb had absorbed all the cows, one horse, Romani, and Link. They'd been taken from the ranch like they never existed. The fairy eventually found the will to examine the scene of the crime. As suspected, each stable was empty, and the ghosts left behind no evidence. She flew to Epona, her eyes wide with concern. Well? Tattle said to the hero's steed. Dread threatened to overtake her, but she held that reaction back. I can't give up yet, the fairy thought. Link wouldn't give up on me. The horse only buzzed her lips in reply. <sighs> you and Link don't have a just-in-case-he's-ever-kidnapped-by-ghosts backup plan? You never had to anticipate that in Hyrule? Epona turned to the tree line, blinking against the evening's gentle wind. He's not out there! The light thing made him disappear, and now he'll come back in the morning all weird! And that's if we're lucky. She recalled something Kremia had said. I searched I all night for her, for them, for a sign of anything. But I didn't find her until the next morning. She came walking on her own down the dirt path. Tattle considered. The orb hadn't just disappeared once she thought more about it. It had flown away, as if a destination was in mind. Hmm. Actually, maybe you're onto something, Tattle said to Epona. Let's go chase the ghost ball thing. She watched Epona stare at her blankly. And here I am talking to a horse. I don't know how Link survived being alone in Snowhead for so long. Epona looked back at the tree line again, as if egging her on. Okay, okay. Tattle said. You're right. Let's go save Link. I owe him one. Or several. Suddenly, Link fell onto grass. His ears rang, and his vision blurred. He lay there on his stomach as rough hands grabbed him. He heard a little girl's voice and the sound of frantic farm animals, but he also heard his captor's heavy breathing. The person, the man, shouted something, and he tied a rope around Link's body. When the hero's mind finally cleared, he felt his chest rising and falling with his breaths. Oh, I'm alive, he thought in bewilderment. The hero had no memory of his journey to this new place. The last thing he recalled was that ball of light absorbed him. When his vision finally cleared, Link discovered he couldn't move his arms or legs beneath his new restraints. He'd been tied against a beam of wood from his sitting position, turning to see Romani tethered to another pole nearby. Their poles supported a wooden awning hanging above them. The awning jutted out from a rocky cliff with grass beneath it and a nighttime terminal around him. Link saw two figures in coats and hoods leading cows into a large fenced field nearby. Those who still awaited imprisonment paced uncomfortably, mooing and calling for help. Aside from the makeshift ranch, captives, and captors, the area was a pit stop hidden away in a wooded clearing. A fireplace, tents, pitchforks, crates, lanterns, and bags littered the area, too. Stinky the horse, as the one non-cow and non-human, gathered his whereabouts quicker than everyone else. The steed fled into the forest before either of the strangers could attend to him. They hardly seemed to care, struggling quite a bit with the cows. Link watched the horse flee right by the ghost's orb. The mysterious vehicle levitated by the fire, as if on standby. Only one ghost had been spawned next to it, and the orb didn't appear active otherwise, aside from its perpetual glow. A singular phantom stared straight ahead at the two men. The hero quietly pushed against the ropes, never taking his eyes off the ghost with the lantern eyes. He was unsuccessful, however. The ropes were too tight. His back already hurt from being forced so intensely against the pole. When Link looked to his left, he found his sword, clocktown shield, and bag not far away, but his restrained arms and legs could not retrieve them. His hands, 
which was tied by his side, moved to his belt, but his ocarina wasn't there either. Oh, I tried to take it out, Link remembered. He'd been inches away from the ghost's orb when he risked playing the Song of Time, but had spiraled from his hand. Eventually, he found it, abandoned by the fire pit several feet away. The ghost levitating near it hadn't noticed the instrument either, and the two captors didn't appear to have themselves. Link looked to see Romani begin to stir. She groaned, opening her eyes to discover their location and capture. For one frightening moment, Link thought she'd been changed to an emotionless husk again. But he was wrong. Link watched the emotions flash across her face. Confusion, fear at seeing the ghost, and realization when she noticed the ropes binding her. Then she saw Link. Uh, grasshopper! Shh! Link exclaimed, turning to see the two men were still preoccupied. They only had a couple of cows left to herd. Don't let them know we're awake yet. What happened? She asked, quieter, but still frantic. The last thing I remember was floating up. They got me. And they got you too? Link nodded. They must have taken us somewhere not far from the ranch. I'm pretty sure these are the same woods. He looked to the orb of light and ghost again, waiting. Watching the men, Link realized, as if they're doing the men's bidding. Was this as simple as a spurned competitor using magic to steal Romani's cows? Had Link and Romani been accidental captives? Romani, Link said softly. Without the hero talking, Romani started wasting her energy fighting against the ropes. So I'll keep distracting her, he thought. The young girl looked up to him with wide, hopeful eyes. We're going to be okay, but I need your help right now. Tell me the story about the ghosts, the one Anju's grandmother told you. Please help me, Romani whispered in terror. I don't want to get hurt. I won't let that happen, Link said. But I need you to tell me the story. Maybe I can find a clue to save us. I don't remember all of it. Then just tell me the parts you do. She didn't seem convinced, or maybe she was too panicked to try. Romani, please. You told me they wanted revenge on the giants, remember? Mm, yes. Romani began, even if her breathing never steadied itself. Because the giants punished them? Punished them? Link asked, looking at the lone phantom nearby and wondering if it could understand them. For what? For being thieves and bandits. For killing and stealing. She somehow summoned enough courage to keep talking. Link was proud of her. She was brave for someone so young. The giants ripped their souls out of their hearts and put them in their eyes. So they couldn't fail anymore, but were cursed to see other people's joy. Their eyes search forever for something they can only see in other people, but can never have again. When Link looked at the ghost's lantern-like eyes next, a chill ran along his spine. Is that all you remember? Link asked. She shook her head, as if trying to say something without speaking. Romani? Shut this one up! Link turned to find the source of the gruff voice, just in time to see his captor shove a cloth into his open mouth. The man tied the handkerchief behind the hero's hand, rough hands holding his head still. Link fought against it, but lost. A taste of sweat and dirt was now heavy in his mouth. Romani watched, petrified, as the hooded figures took away Link's voice. The other stranger lifted Link's bag, spilled its contents onto the grass, and immediately sifted through his belongings. The two men were the same height and seemed familiar with one another, but with their hoods drawn, it was hard to make out anything else. One held up Odawa's mask before tossing it dismissively away, the other found a handful of glistening rupees and lynx bows, arrows, and ice axes. This fella sure looks like he was ready for a fight, the stranger said. A strong, rural accent caught Link off guard. The hero tried his best to push the smell and taste of their sweaty rag from his mouth, continually checking to ensure the ocarina remained unnoticed by the fire pit. What do you think this one does? One stranger held the lens of truth before his face, peering through it suspiciously. It doesn't make nothing bigger. I don't have a clue, the other said. All these items and masks are so strange. He held onto the Deku scrub mask last, 
Running his fingers across its rough wooden texture, the captor approached Link, kneeling before him and revealing the inside of his hood. However, there was nothing. Where there should be a face was only darkness, and it wasn't a trick of the light either. Somehow, this person's face was magically absent. The rims of his stitched hood simply vanished into black, and it appeared disconnected from the rest of his cloak. Only two tiny eyes shone back, featureless aside from looking like stars in a nighttime sky. They appeared almost as unnatural as the ghost's eyes behind him. The stranger's rural accent continued to clash with his magical appearance. You didn't get none of these masks from Akana, did you? Link stared angrily back into the hood, still gagged and refusing to nod or shake his head. You're, you're the Gorman brothers, Romani said. All three men turned their attention to her. Oh no, the hero thought. She shouldn't have said that aloud. Link put together what had gotten Romani into trouble on the last cycle. What'd you just say? The man with twinkling eyes stood to walk over to Romani. Link struggled against his binds again, but it was still useless. He watched as the other man joined the first. According to Romani, they were brothers, and given their reaction, Link believed she was right. The second brother's hood did not appear magical like the first. His features were simply hidden behind the normal shadow a cloak offered. I... I just see it. Romani swallowed, squirming uncomfortably as the men surrounded her. Link tried to scream through his restraints, but nothing came out. Well, what the damn do we do now? The brother without the magical hood lowered his, revealing a harsh, pale face with thick eyebrows, thinning hair, and a handlebar mustache. I won't tell anyone, Romani exclaimed, tears welling in her eyes. Please, I promise, if you just let us go, I'll keep it a secret. We can't kill him, the unhooded Gorman brother said, raising an eyebrow. Can we? Link's rope kept biting into his skin the more he fought, and the pole dug further into his back. But he didn't stop. Eventually, he saw his sword again, still nearby and alongside his abandoned bag and possessions. There's gotta be a way I can reach those, he thought. The hooded brother didn't answer. Instead, he approached the lone ghost until they were face to face. Can you do to that girl what the giants did to you? He said. The ghost's lantern-like eye stared into the magic hood for only a moment, and then the phantom shifted its attention, as if in acknowledgement of the command. Its haunted eyes found Romani. It drifted toward her, and Romani began fighting against her restraints as intensely as Link. Please, she said, whimpering. As the phantom drew nearer, she tried to push herself further into the pole, shrinking away from the ghost's glowing hands as they reached for her. Its curled fingertips stretched outward, and Romani opened her mouth as all breath left her lungs. No! Link thought, but he could say or do nothing. The world around them seemed hushed as the golden hand reached for the little girl's heart. Unexpectedly, a gasp from the hooded Gorman brother broke the silence. The phantom's hand stopped just short of Romani's chest. Link turned to see the leader's magical hood had been removed, revealing a similar face to his brother's, and it had not been removed voluntarily. Tattle was the culprit, holding the disconnected hood in her hands and flying out of reach. The Gorman brother tried to swat her too late. No! He shouted. Give it back, give it back! You don't know what you're doing! I can't control the ghosts without it! The Phantom immediately lost interest in Romani, focusing on its ex-commander instead. Its yellow lantern eyes turned crimson red along with the orb of light that served as their vehicle. The younger brother's eyes widened in terror. He turned to run, but the ghost's glowing hand grabbed his shoulder before he could. No, please, don't! It forced him against the rock wall beneath the awning, and Link and Romani watched as the phantom went rogue, clearly channeling immense rage. Its obedience had clearly not been consensual. Tattle hung the magic hood on a high tree branch out of the other Gorman brother's reach. The man angrily waved his fists and leapt up and down, trying to reach it in vain. You den forsaken sprite, get down here so I can... He stopped, turning to see what was happening to his brother. Help me! 
The captive man screamed. The ghost's golden fingers plunged into his chest, passing harmlessly through his skin as if it wasn't there. The brother screamed, craning his head back as the ghost's magical hand searched for something inside him. Ango! The older brother exclaimed, but he was too far away to intervene. Link's horrified expression was interrupted by Tattle, who'd flown behind him. I'm gonna get you out of here, she said, whispering as she tried to undo his restraints. When the ghost removed its fingers from the younger brother's chest, it extracted a ball of glowing light. The new sphere shone brilliantly in its already shining hand. When the phantom released Ingo's shoulder, he exhaled in defeat and collapsed. The ghost grabbed the lantern against the rock wall, shoved Ingo's ball of light inside, and tossed the lantern beside the fallen Gorman brother. Ingo remained motionless and dazed. Tattle frantically tried to undo the hero's ropes as the ghost turned to Link next. He tried to help, pushing against the restraints and squirming as her tiny hands tried their best. The ghost's orb reacted next, touching the ground lightly to spawn two more ghosts, one near Romani and one near the older brother. All three began approaching the remaining human targets, clearly not discriminatory in who fell victim to their revenge. The older Gorman brother was the only person in a position to defend himself, retrieving a pitchfork and leveling it at the approaching red-eyed ghost. Tattle still hadn't released Link's restraints when the phantom's glowing hands grabbed Link's shoulder. The hero felt the air leave his chest as the world around him came to a slow spiral. His next breath was colder than even Snowhead's greatest blizzard. The phantom raised its hand, ready to reach into Link's chest and remove his spirit. <coughs> Tattle exclaimed, abandoning her useless rescue attempt. She turned to find another solution, honing in on Link's spilled possessions. The ghost plunged its hand into Link's chest, and his eyes shot open in shock. I can't breathe, he thought. The ghost's red eyes became his entire world. The spotlights tore through his very being, leaving his flesh icy cold. He felt every memory, thoughts, and feelings start to slip away, pooling in his chest as the ghost summoned it into one ball of light. Then... Tattle threw the Goron mask over Link's face. The ropes around Link exploded as his back hardened and his stomach expanded. His sudden girth launched the ghost several feet away, tearing its fingers forcefully away from his chest before it could finish. The pole behind Link snapped violently in half too, and Link scrambled to his feet as the awning began to teeter and collapse. He didn't get away in time. Link curled inward to protect himself as debris rained over him and the unconscious Ingo. Thankfully, the sliver of ceiling above Romani remained intact, supported by her pole and only torn askew. Link didn't waste time recovering. He pushed the debris away with his powerful Goron arms and Tattle flew to rejoin him. Darmani's eyes found Romani, who screamed as the second ghost approached her despite the awning's collapse. The hero ran to rescue her, his large Goron body thudding heavily on the ground. The older Gorman brother thrust his pitchfork toward his own attacker pointed ends traveled straight through it, and the phantom successfully vanished. But the glowing orb immediately went into action again, dotting the ground to spawn even more enemies. He looked around in panic, noting his brother had collapsed beneath debris. The older brother looked to the sky next, which began to brighten with a new day. He narrowed his eyes, tightened his grip on the pitchfork, and wielded it against the army of ghosts approaching him. Link punched Romani's ghost just before it grabbed her. It vanished on impact, and the hero ripped the girl's restraints away in one fell swoop. He noticed blood on his arm, but refused to take time now to assess his injuries. <sighs> so much for getting healed by the great fairy, he thought glumly. Once Romani was free and standing, Link turned to see ten other ghosts already filling the small clearing, and the orb was busy making more. Romani surprised him with a scream. The boy backed away, realizing that she was screaming at him, a human who had suddenly turned into a big, imposing Goron. Ah, Din, he thought. To make matters worse, the phantom's ringing noise of doom had returned, just as disarming as it had been on the ranch. Chaos ensued. The older Gorman brother fended off phantoms with a pitchfork, while Link did the same with his fists. Romani screamed from behind the Goron. Tattle floated to and fro without knowing how to help, 
and Epona, who had accompanied Tattle, waited uncertainly outside the clearing as the late night descended into madness. Link, there are too many! Tattle said. Link had come to the same conclusion after punching his sixth ghost in the face. He ignored Romani's screaming, picked her up, and socked another ghost on his way, barreling towards his possessions. Once he reached them, he put Romani down and removed his mask. The little girl gasped at his transformation back to a human, but Link said nothing. He attached his scabbard as Tattle scooped his masks and other belongings into his bag. The phantoms, though thankfully still slow, never halted their pursuit. G Grasshopper! <laughs> Romani exclaimed, overwhelmed as her screaming gave way to crying. Stay behind me! Link said as he leapt in front of her. Romani hesitantly obeyed as the hero pulled his gilded sword into his left hand. He slashed outward to defeat three ghosts at once, and then he returned his bag to his shoulder with Tattle's help. Link turned to face the next wave, but it was far more than three ghosts. No matter how slow they move, Link thought, they're going to overwhelm us soon. He kept swinging his sword, slaying as many as he could, but soon there wasn't an inch of grass unoccupied by a ghost. Hundreds threatened to rip out everyone's souls for good. Link made sure Romani remained behind him and Tattle was by his side. Eventually, the phantoms backed them into the pen's fence. The cows mooed and concerned on the other side. The older Gorman brother held his own too, though he'd been backed into the fire pit and was also surrounded. Grasshopper! Romani stammered nervously, hardly audible over the horrible warbling sound. Hundreds of red spotlights, their eyes, their lost souls, stared at them hungrily for a meal. Um, Link, I know that I was supposed to be the one to save you this time, Tattle said, gulping as she realized they were cornered. But I think I messed up. Don't worry, Link said, exhaling as the attackers closed in. He slid his sword back into his scabbard and drew his bow, notching an arrow. Get ready to run. His next arrow traveled sharply through the air, cutting through several ghosts who all vanished. This left a parting in the crowd of phantoms, a momentary path that led them to the clearing's exit. Epona waited at its end. Run! Link, Romani, and Tattle sped through the opening. The ghosts closed in regardless, their glowing hands reaching out to stop them. One grabbed Link's shoulder before he made it halfway through, and two others grabbed his forearms. A third wrapped its illuminated fingers around his throat, and a fourth stared into his eyes. He saw Romani fail to make it as well, screaming when the ghosts restrained her. Link's captor overwhelmed him exactly as the one before, chilling the air, slowing his heart, and throwing everything but its eyes into the background. It reared its hand upward to try stealing his soul again. But abruptly, they all vanished. Every ghost, the warbling noise their glowing circular vehicle. They disappeared without a trace. Link and Romani collapsed when the ghosts restraining them vanished, and Tattle looked into the sky and saw the new dawn had arrived. The sun had dispelled the ghosts for good, just as Romani had said. They were gone. Link struggled to catch his breath, allowing himself to lie on his back since the threat was over. He closed his eyes, smiling victory. We won. He thought. Link! Tattle screamed. The boy opened his eyes at her warning. The oldest Gorman brother stood over him, pitchfork raised. He brought the sharp end down, but Link rolled out of the way. He scrambled to his feet, sword in hand, just in time to block another blow from the angry farmer. You killed my brother! He shrieked with despair. Link redirected the pointed weapon again, maintaining his even footing. Regardless of Link's other talents, this was his greatest skill, a battle between drawn swords. He waited for the Gorman brothers' next move as his enemy currently blocked the clearing's exit. They stood there in silence, with only their heavy breathing, weapons ready. Romani, run! Link shouted. The girl obeyed, sprinting into the forest immediately. You lost me my army! The Gorman brother swung his weapon again, though Link easily redirected the pitchfork. You ruined everything! On the next parry, Link sent the Gorman brother stumbling backward toward the fire pit. 
his enemy was off balance, and the hero used his next swing to cut off the pitchfork's pointed end. The three-pronged weapon's lethal side spiraled uselessly into the grass. Now, Link's enemy was disarmed and no longer blocking his exit. The boy mockingly waved goodbye and turned to leave. Coward! The older brother yelled, swinging his pole after him. But it was useless. The weapon was no longer dangerous and far too short. Link reached Epona and almost grabbed her reins to leave. But he made a realization. Ah, my ocarina, he thought. He turned to the fire pit and saw his instrument still lying in the same spot, unnoticed. However, the Gorman brother followed his gaze, and his hateful expression renewed its focus. The hero instinctively reached for his bow, but before he could, the man kicked his ocarina into the fire. No! Link screamed. He notched an arrow, blind with panic as he aimed for the brother. Step away from the fire! Now! If you were gonna kill me, then you would- ah! An arrow sailed through the air, interrupting the Gorman brother by impaling his shoulder. I said get away from the fire! Link exclaimed, already walking there himself. The Gorman brother wailed in agony as he abandoned the clearing, sprinting through the forest while he bled. Link rushed to the fire pit and drew his sword. He fished his ocarina out, rolling it around beneath his boot to stamp out the remaining flames. Once it was safe, the boy retrieved his instrument into his hands. It was still warm, and there were new scorch marks burnt into it though those new scars paled in comparison to the Skull Kid's lethal mark. The second day's remaining hours were long. Link found Romania returned her home. Kremia embraced her traumatized younger sister, though thankfully she wasn't catatonic or soulless. We won't be able to tell her everything, Link had told Romani as they rode back to the ranch. Why not? she'd asked. Because she won't believe us. We just have to tell her the Gorman brothers kidnapped us, but that we got away. Romani had hesitantly agreed, though Link doubted she could keep up the lie for long. Link's next stop had been to Clock Town, where he had gathered enough guards. They'd returned with him to the crime scene, but the Gorman brothers were nowhere to be found. Ingo had been removed from the debris, and the older brother's trail of blood led nowhere. The cows had still been fenced, but the guards helped return them to Romani's ranch. Stinky was returned to his home as well, and Tattle explained how the horse had been responsible for saving them. I followed the ball of light with Epona as far as we could, but we got lost pretty fast. It wasn't until that abominably named animal came running out of the trees that we found the camp. Now, Link sat outside Romani's house and watched the sunset, though he carried the weight of yet another traumatic fight. He'd won. There was no downside or a need to find a silver lining. Romani had been saved, the cows were returned, and the Gorman brothers had lost their weapon. For once, Link thought, an uncomplicated victory. He needed this on top of the Great Fairy's healing. Thankfully, his only injuries had been a bloodied arm on his Goron form from the falling debris. The hero watched Epona nibble on hay alongside his fairy. He was content. Romani soon came to join them. Dinner's ready, Grasshopper, she said, smiling. Though it might take a while for her to process what happened, she was still herself. The little girl looked up at him, rocking on her feet. Hmm, <laughs> you really are a hero, aren't you? The Skull Kid sat in darkness. He was far enough in the cave to avoid all daylight, but his eyes were used to it. The imp had been staring at the chalk mural for hours. From behind Majora's mask, the Skull Kid followed the gray lines as they formed the horse, Tsunami, Castle, and thousands of people dying. Do it, Majora said, and you will see. The Skull Kid gulped. He raised his hand and placed it on the cave's cool, rugged surface, right over the horse. He watched as the chalk lines moved. They cut violently across the existing drawing of Hyrule, as if with a will of their own, erasing the images from existence to form new ones. The masked imp backed away from the new mural and its slithering, dark gray snakes. Soon, the Skull Kid recognized a familiar plane of desolation. 
and his mind flashed back to what he'd seen for himself after the moon fell. He felt that deep sadness again. The death of a whole new world, he thought. Everyone and everything gone. But Majora extinguished that brief flame of sadness when it spoke next. See, your land will be purified as well. This wall only shows truth. In the end, my vision for Termina will become reality. The Skull Kid remembered the power that always coursed through his veins when he bathed in the ashes. How could something so pure, flawless, and absolute be anything but perfection? My servant has returned to us. The imp was surprised when fear flowered in his chest. He turned to find a pair of red eyes, seemingly floating in the darkness. The shadow never blinked. There was something unsettling about this killer's perfection, as if it was the embodiment of those ashes. <laughs> We've been waiting for you, the Skull Kid said. There was no response. We must teach you to use the power inside of you so it doesn't corrupt you. Majora's influence isn't the only magic you have now. Combining the light and dark without letting the light win will take practice. Again, no response. <laughs> Follow us. Our source of power will be your teacher. The Skull Kid led the way, and Dark Link followed. All was silent in the wasteland. The gray desert of death stretched forever onward as its eternally dark sky grumbled. The mountains behind them, a barrier separating what had been lost from what was left. But they were far away, alongside the cave they used to get there. There were no buoys or landmarks as far out as the Skull Kid and Dark Link were. The imp floated in place, arms crossed. Darkling stood shin-deep in the ashes, its crimson eyes closed as the being centered itself. When they opened, the shadow's eyes were purple instead. It extended its right arm, and rich, violet flames burst forth. They curled and danced with life, and when the shadow raised its other arm, the dance of darkness continued. The purple flames licked the gray landscape, curling upward like a dragon had burst forth from a gray sea, flying skyward to extend its dark wings. The dragon danced gracefully around its master, its purple flames crashing into one another and bellowing forth time and time again. The fire followed the rhythm and direction of its conductor. The dark song flowed from the shadow's fingertips, chilling the land with its incredible heat. As Dark Link braced itself for the finale, the fire obeyed. The last explosion was the most brilliant of all. The purple fire became a burst dam, stretching outward to dazzle the darkness with corrupted life. The Skull Kid watched. Majora's wooden eyes reflected the dark fire. When it finally ended, the last of those brilliant curls faded into the monochromatic landscape. When the shadow stood before its masters again, Dark Link's eyes were red. The imp didn't say anything at first, and neither did Dark Link. It's stronger than me, the imp realized. It will take my place. Behind the heart-shaped mask, the Skull Kid's eyes narrowed into thin slits. Don't forget who you are, the imp said. Watch, Watch your, your tongue, tongue, Majora replied. The Skull Kid balked, even knowing that Dark Link could not hear the demon's voice. It reverberated only in his mind. Which is one power I have over this cheap shadow who imitates a hero, the imp thought. I'm still the chosen one. Enough, Majora said. You forget your place. The Skull Kid relented. He floated down so his feet were barely above the plane of ashes. He stared directly into Dark Link's red eyes. You are not the one in power, 
the imp said. You come second to m second to Majora, and you must remember that. No response. <laughs> now go and kill the boy and burn his ocarina. The shadow left without another word, crossing the plain of desolation to reach the cave, leading back to Termina. <laughs> Should we follow him? A skull kid whispered. Can we trust him? He is a pawn that will do my bidding without question. As the skull kid nodded, but his fist remained clenched by his side. 